Welcome back to Visited by Voices Live. I'm joined tonight, as always, by my co-host, Sam. Hello, everybody. And also by an extremely, extremely special guest. I've been lucky on this show to speak to so many of my heroes, uh, people like Ramsey Campbell and Brian Hodge and Kathy Koja and F. Paul Wilson. And right up there in that mix uh, is tonight's guest, uh, a writer that really opened my eyes to what was possible in fiction at a time when I really needed it, Gary A. Bronbeck. How are you, Gary? Uh, fine, thanks. thanks for that lovely intro. Very much appreciated. Well, you were one of those guys when when the indifference of heaven hit the market and it was being chatted about a lot in the small press horror community, a lot, like deafeningly. Uh, I went in skeptically, like I always do, people saying this is really different. This is the next generation. This is the next mo major movement in horror. And then, God damn it, you did it. You You actually won me over within a chapter and I went on this transcendent journey with you that I do think changed the genre. Now, nothing changes every corner of the genre, but you opened up alleyways that were not there before that book. And I, I, we will get to the legacy of that book in particular at a certain okay. point. But um, yeah, no, it's you You are an extraordinarily important figure in the genre as far as I'm concerned. I think as far as a lot of people are concerned. Oh, thanks very much. That's, that's nice to hear. Um, <laughs> not, to, not to embarrass you with too much praise. If it makes you feel any better, I had no idea who you were until I started reading Mr. Hands. So, <laughs> That's okay. you know, I think it balances out pretty well. No, but yeah, Mr. You know, Hands is epic. Like it's, I'm just you know in the first couple of chapters, but the description of Mr. Hands in the landscape creeped me right the fuck out. I was like, ugh. Well, um, the um, figure, Mr. Hands himself, um, is a creation of Alan M. Clark's. Um, he did a series of paintings based on this particular creature. And we were doing a, that's a cat back there, by the way. Um, we were doing a, a project together. We were going to do a, a, a book together of um, stories that inspired paintings by him and paintings that inspired stories by me. And um, he showed me these three paintings of this particular creature that he referred to as Mr. Hans and said, what's the story here? And... I took off from there, um, so I'm, uh, I'm I'm glad that you like the book, Mary, very much. Um, yeah, I'm going to talk about that a little more later on um, because that book was an attempt by me to um, to see it. Thank you to sort of show that I I like to practice what I preach um, as far as what I consider to be uh, what constitutes really rewarding horror for me. So. Very cool. But we got to start at the beginning. Okay. So we all have a first day in the genre. How did you get bit by the horror bug? Oh, well, that was when I was a kid. Um, my father worked um, various shifts at the factory where he was employed. And for a long while, um, he would have a special shift on Friday so that he could get off about 11 p.m., and be home by 11:30 p.m. because that's when um, a local um, a local program called Fritz the Night Owl was on, and every Friday night, Fritz would show a double feature of horror movies. Uh, sometimes they were really good, and sometimes not so much. But Dad would come home, um, Mom would set up these two TV dinner trays, and we'd sit there and we. We'd watch movies like, uh, you know, um, Murders at the Zoo or The Fly or The Incredible Shrinking Man or The Monolith Monsters or what have you. And that was always very special to me because there were times when the movies would get just a little scary for me. And I'd huddle up next to Dad and I'd say, hold me. And he would put his arm around me and he would sometimes do this if he knew something really, really scary was coming up. But, of course, any time he would do this... I would do this because I had to, I had to see. And um, that led to um, that led to me being a, uh, a really voracious reader of magazines like Creepy, Eerie, and Vampirella. And that is that's when I got bitten by it. And I didn't really um, I didn't really think I had the um, 
wherewithal to be a horror writer or the desire to be a horror writer until one uh, one uh, one autumn I came down with the worst case of pneumonia and I only had um, I was on the couch and nobody was coming in or out of the living room because you know I'm laying there you know with you know the plague all over me <laughs> and I had a, I had a stack of books and the first three books on the stack were Stephen King's Night Shift Graham Masterton's The Manitou and William Kotzwinkel's Dr. Rat. And by the time I finished those three books, I would, first of all, I was a nervous wreck. And I was also just really enamored of the way these three authors wrote. Um, I still think King's The Boogeyman and um, the story Night Shift are two of the scariest damn stories I've ever read in my life. Um, the Manitou, I have, I have yet to read, an, I, 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 well, I won't say I have yet to, but that's one of the few novels I've read that keeps building chapter by chapter by chapter by chapter until you're just, your hands are shaking, but you got to finish reading it. And Dr. Rat is both nightmarish and absolutely gorgeous in some of the writing, uh, which is pretty much, uh, you can say that about anything Cotswinkle's done. But by the time I finished those three books, I thought, God damn it! I'm I'm going to try this. I'm going to see if I have, you know, if I have a, a knack for this at all. And it took, it took uh, probably about hmm, maybe ten years after that before I started um, placing stories in small press magazines. And we're back. We're talking about back in the you know the jurassic or thoracic period or whatever you want to call it oh, when we're... you actually had to send stuff with an s-a-s-e and wait for however long it took for them to get back to you and then for however long it was going to take for the the magazine itself to come out and i just i submitted to every place that i could think of um markets that paid markets that uh didn't pay markets that were contributors copies and then um alan datlow picked up a story of mine for the year's best fantasy and horror. Um, and that, um, that, that, that really buoyed me. And I started to submit to, to bigger markets. And the first outright big professional sale I made was to Twilight Zone's Night Cry magazine. And that was 1985. And they wound up buying four stories from me only one of which actually got published before the magazine folded, exactly. unfortunately. I, I missed that. I missed that, and I missed Twilight Zone magazine itself because those were both those were both just terrific publications. Twilight Zone magazine was the first magazine I subscribed to. Yeah. I still have the very first issue, and it's still in pretty, pretty damn good shape <laughs> because I remember when I bought that, I was buying it because I was going to – I was going out to uh, – Topeka to visit my grandmother and I wanted something to read on the bus and all of a sudden I saw this oh Twilight Zone magazine I pick it up and what's on the cover but a brand new story by Harlan Ellison so yeah here take my money exactly. hurry take my money right so a year after that uh, year's best in in 86 you actually saw a story to Eldrith Tales uh, from children's uh, from children's hours I have not been right yes that had to have hit right after the, that uh, Twilight Zone appearance, right? Yeah. So that was certainly a different audience because Twilight Zone was uh, not purely a horror magazine. It was a yeah. speculative uh, fiction magazine in a general sense, but Eldrith was not being read by anyone who wasn't actually probably a deep reader in the genre. Yeah. Um, which, uh, you know, which I always thought was kind of unfortunate because the editor and publisher, Chris Burnham, Every penny that he made at his job went into publishing that magazine. And he did finally get a World Fantasy Award nomination, which I was glad to see. But the magazine itself never really took off. And that, uh, I always thought that was very sad. But even though he knew it wasn't, uh, you know, a big sale or a very popular out there, he kept doing it. He kept doing it, God bless him, because it's what he loved. So. Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, we're now in an era where 
really the small press magazine, as it were, the limited distribution magazine doesn't exist anymore yeah. to any to any real extent. Um, but I mean, as I was growing up, things like Twilight Zone, and then later on things like New Blood, eventually things like Cemetery Dance were kind of the lifeblood of what was happening in the short story format in the genre. And I feel like we've kind of lost that. And I think something vital got lost at that point too, because short stories are vitally important to the horror yeah. genre. I wonder, you say Night Shift was one of your first. It was one of my first, too. I wonder how many people, not just writers, but how many people fell in love with the genre because of a book like Night Shift. I think that that collection, that was a cornerstone collection for, um, uh, for the genre. And um, I think probably a lot of people came to horror after reading that particular collection. And um, as damn well they should have, because that was one of his finest. Um, one, a recent collection of novellas that he did, I'm not, I'm not talking about If It Bleeds, which I've not read all of yet, but what I have read has been great. His previous collection of novellas, Full Dark, No Stars. Mm -hmm. um, oh my God. Could you find something darker than the four stories that were in that collection. Uh, it just, I thought, my, initially I thought, well, man, that takes a, takes a lot of guts on his part. And then I realized, well, no, not really, because he's got a built-in audience. But to assault your audience with four novellas that get progressively darker and darker and darker, that was quite something. And then he turns around and uh, a couple of years ago released a, um, a short novel. Um, oh, do you know the one I'm talking about? Uh, the guy who continues to get lighter and lighter despite the fact that he keeps weighing himself down. Do you know? Thinner. I can't, what's that? Thinner. Yeah, uh, no, not thinner. Um, Never mind. Damn. So uh, close. Uh, I'll be honest with you. Um, Recent King is still a blind spot for me. Give me um, one second. I've been spending so sure. I've been spending so much time reading other writers that King has been back burner for me for a while. Elevation. Oh. I don't I Elevation that. is, in my opinion, one of the five finest things he's ever written, and it's not it's not horror at all. Um, I suppose some people can interpret it that way, but it, it's a very it, it's a it's a deeply humane, almost theological um, study of what keeps people apart and what brings them together, and one person's journey toward enlightenment. Um, that makes it sound that makes that doesn't make it sound you know like a. Uh, like a page turner, but it is. Um, so there, I, I just, I, I, I've just, uh, I've just, I've just wrecked Stephen King. You know, so I just recommended Stephen King, which I, I know he's been sitting in Maine waiting for me for just a little exposure from yeah, some. Just a little it's exposure from me. Uh, yeah, we we talk on this channel. We talk all the time about the the king, what I call the king problem, which is not an attack on the man or his writing, but just that the media seems to think that the man is the genre and there is no one else working. Um, so when you when you pick up a Entertainment Weekly, if they cover anything horror, it's got to be king related. Yeah, we we need some way to break away from that kind of homogeny, and I don't know how how we exactly do that. Yeah, and. Um... I don't want anyone to misinterpret what I'm about to say here. Um, the rise in popularity of Joe Hill isn't going to help that any. You're right. Um, <laughs> because, no, not now. His stuff is great. I love his stuff. I really do. But it's no longer a secret that he is King's son. And everyone's been saying, well, you know, what are we going to do when King, you know, we, we, we don't have another Stephen King. Well, yeah, now we kind of do. And um, I, I think that um, I think that that's going to um, that's going to prolong that particular problem that you were talking about. This is not again. I want to make sure that everyone knows this is not me slighting Joe Hill and his work 
at all because I'm not because I am a great admirer of his work. So, Absolutely. The same way it's not an attack on King to talk about the media's problem right. and how they deal with him. Right. Um, I'm sure he gets sick of this shit. Oh, you know, yeah. After all yes. these years. But to go back to you, because we could talk King <laughs> elsewhere with someone else. Okay. Um, so um, you were a part of a, uh, a big part, actually, of an important uh, anthology series called Masks. Mm -hmm. um, you, in 89, you sold a story, um, All But the Ties Eternal, yes. to Masks 3 um, for Jan Williamson, who in his own right is a monster of the genre. Yeah. And then you'd go on uh, more than a couple years later to co-edit uh, the fifth volume. Yeah. Um, Jerry was um, Jerry was extremely sick um, during that time. And he had um, he had lost um, about half of the material that he had accepted for Masks Five between moving from his home into the um, into the nursing home where he spent the last two years of his life. And Barry Hoffman had contacted me because he knew that I was going. I you know a friend of mine named Ron Horsley and myself were going out to visit Jerry quite often. And very often contacted me. He goes, look, can you do me a favor? And the next time you're out there is get whatever Jerry has and, and bring it back. And would you consider, you know, finishing things up for him? And I said, absolutely. So I went out there and I got what Jerry had and I came back to Ohio and I went about contacting those writers um, who were on the acceptance list who I did not have stories from. And then once all that was done, um, we the book was still only about three quarters full. So I, um, I talked with Barry Hoffman and he gave me a list of some writers that he would like me to contact. And I gave him a few names and he said, okay, well, you know, go on ahead. And luckily everybody said yes. <laughs> and um, then we decided... <laughs> decided to, uh, to to really go out on a limb. And I contacted Clyde Barker. Well, I contacted Clyde Barker's people to see if if um, he would be willing to, uh, you know, give us, you know, give us a story. Well, not give us a story, but sell us a story. And, and um, one night um, I was at work and uh, Lucy, um, Lucy Snyder, uh, my wife, was uh, home by herself and she was sick as a dog. And the phone rings, and she answers it, and the voice on the other end says, yes, is, is Gary Braun back there, please? And she says, no, no, he's, he's at work. Can I take a message? She goes, he, and, she go, and he goes, well, yes, this is, this is Clyde Barker. And I'm calling about uh, Masks 5, and well, that's a lousy Barker imitation, I know. Because <laughs> um, if you ever hear him talk, he's got the most wonderful, mellifluous voice. So I get home that night. And she comes up and grabs me and goes, Clive Barker, come. <laughs> I said, oh, okay. Like it was, you know, an everyday thing, me being Mr. Cool. Um, so I, um, I, I, called, uh, I called the number back um, the next day. And I expected to get, you know, an assistant, which I did. And I said, oh, um, I'm returning Mr. Barker's call. My name is Gary Brombeck. And he goes, oh, hang on. And Barker gets on the line, and I got to talking. I got to talking with him for several minutes, and he didn't have a story because he has a he had a really heavy schedule at the time. He goes, but I would be more than happy to do a couple of paintings for you. <laughs> okay, we can't pay very much. Oh no no no! This is for Jerry. So we got two brand new Clive Barker paintings for the collection and he signed the signature sheets so with that and a brand new what turned out to be anyway the um last real horror story that poppy z bright wrote um plus we had two stories from ray bradbury and two from richard matheson i mean it was a good lineup as far as I'm, i thought it was a great lineup actually managed to get the whole thing together and i was able to give jerry the full table of contents before he died. And he was just so moved. I mean, the man actually broke into tears and gave me the, this, 
sorry, <laughs> um, gave me this great big hug. And he never, he didn't see, live to see the publication of the book, which will always sadden me no end. But I, I, I find some comfort in knowing that he passed on knowing that he was well loved and well respected enough in the field that masks five was able to have the table of contents that it did. You know, it took me about a year and a half, um, after that, after getting the initial batch of stuff from, uh, from Jerry to finally, to finalize the, um, the anthology. And it was most, that was mostly what I did for a year and a half. Um, was try and get that whole thing put together. But I was very pleased with the way it came out. And Barry Hoffman asked me about um, about the cover. And I said, no, the cover says edited by Jay and Williamson. That's it. You know, you want to put my, put my name on the inside as co-editor, that's great. But on the cover, it's Jerry's name. And that was one of the both, one of the most rewarding and ultimately and, and heartbreaking experiences I've had. But um, yeah, I don't know if you've, if either of you have ever seen the uh, the anthology, but I, I think it's got one hell of a table of contents. Um, it, so. it follows the tradition of that's an incredible series of books. Yeah, um, right now, uh, Mort Castle and um, oh my God, Terry's gonna I, I can't remember Terry's last name. <sighs> right off. Anyway, the two of them are working on Mask Six. And plus, Mort has uh, got the masks um, uh, comic, pardon me, graphic <laughs> graphic novel series going. Um, and the first one that came out had uh, had a great uh, great adaptation of Robert McCammon's Nightcrawlers in it. So yeah, the uh, yeah the uh, masks legacy uh, is um, is not going to uh, fade out anytime soon. Thank goodness. I want to go to a question from the chat because it's been sitting there since before we were on the okay. air. But um, it comes from uh, Dan Shine of Flesh Wound Features, a great YouTube channel. Can you tell us about the genesis of the Cedar Hill series? I also, my sincere thanks for your fantastic contributions to the genre. Indifference of Heaven is an all-time pa fa personal favorite. I think we're going to hear a lot of that if we, get, <laughs> if we put a lot more of these up. Um, real quick, um, the Indifference of Heaven was the original title of in silent graves, graves. Yeah. um when it was published by leisure it, at the time it turns out their biggest distributor was right smack in the was uh, right it was the buckle of the bible belt and there was no way okay. that they were going to get behind a book called the indifference of heaven mm -hmm. so i had to go and um uh, and find a new title and i remember that uh myself lucy and a friend of ours named lisa dotsauer sat down one night and we started going through the book, trying to find what would be a, 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 a halfway decent title. And at the very end, right, that le remember the letter at the at the very end of the book. There's a, a line about uh, and, and the children who lie in silent graves. And I thought, bingo! So that became that title. Now to actually answer the question, <laughs> um, I grew up in a uh, I grew up in a town called Newark, Ohio which is about a oh, 45 minute drive from, uh, from Columbus and Newark was very much a, um, a solid middle, middle class, um, industrial town. And as I was growing up, more and more industry began to shut down or move away. And the, uh, the people who were until that time solidly middle middle class suddenly like my own family became lower middle class and there there was a lot of uh, there was a lot of day-to-day -day struggle to get by and there were um, there were a couple of uh, of of labor strikes at my dad's factory that wound up going not at all well. There was um, there was quite a bit of violence during one, and there was a couple of times when workers were laid off that the the strike fund ran out. And so um, you learn to love um, 
bologna and mac and cheese <laughs> during times like that. But the um, the whole the whole community, um, there was something there was something inherently sad about everything, even when things seemed to be going well. Because there was you even when things were going well, you could tell that most people were still waiting for the other bomb to go off, and that always sort of cast a shadow on everything. Because a lot of the people that I knew growing up came out of the depression, and this you know they had they had gone through times of of want and, uh, for lack of a better word, despair before. And so they were a little bit better equipped to handle it when it came around again, as things like that are wont to do. But there was also a lot of, uh, this is going to sound strange, but there was also a lot of beauty at the time when I was growing up. Um, there were uh, kids um, were a lot tighter back then. And we're talking, uh, if you've seen the movie Stand By Me, we're talking about that type of uh you know, that type of closeness. And as I grew up and, you know, I began to, uh, I began to write, I realized that a lot of the stories that I was writing were set in one way or another in my memories of Newark. And so I thought, what am I doing? I'm writing about Newark, admittedly with some historical and, um, you know, um, uh, geological changes and um, things along those lines. So I thought, why don't I just create Newark anew as it was, as it is in my memory? And so I went through a bunch of different ways to rename the town. And then it occurred to me, you know, um, a couple of uh, a couple of friends of uh, my family. Um, who had died had been buried in Cedar Hill Cemetery. And I thought, Cedar Hill. So that's how Cedar Hill came about. And the very first Cedar Hill story, which was called A Death in the Day of, appeared in a issue appeared in an issue of uh, Dave Silva's The Horror Show. And I think to date, there's there are are easily uh, at least a hundred stories I've written that are, that are set directly in Cedar Hill. And uh, there are a bunch of stories where the characters, even though they're not in Cedar Hill are from Cedar Hill. Um, so anyway, that's, uh, that's how that came about. Um, it was me trying to reconstruct and, um, and make a bit happier. Um, the memories of my childhood of growing up in Newark. So. I always say that this is a genre about morality and mortality. Yeah. And it's, 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 it's important that when we watch a really bad slasher film, and it's just about mortality and the morality is not part of the equation. That's why it's empty. Yeah. That's um, and your stories always really have a great, great balance. It might tip more to the morality than the mortality side in a lot of cases, but yeah. But I think you do the balance really well, and that's why the work stands out. Well, that's also one of the reasons that really hardcore horror readers hate my stuff. And I, I am aware of this because I'm not giving them what they expect and what they want. And at the same time... Um, people who read more mainstream literary work <laughs> hate my stuff because it's a little too dark and sometimes it's a little too violent. I've, I've, I've learned to live with this. I'm not really crazy about it, but you know, there it is. You're talking about um, mortality versus morality. Um, the, the Saw films have become just ungodly popular. And I will defend, oddly enough, the first Saw movie, because that was as much about morality as it was mortality. Um, and the second one, a, li a little less so, but the, the first two were actually, I, I found them actually kind of fascinating. 
because the violence that occurred in those movies was a direct result of one character's morality or lack thereof. But then starting with the third movie, it just became, it just became, you know, let, let's see how much of an interesting slaughterhouse we yeah. can, you know, we can throw up here on, on the screen. One last, uh, my brain is all over the place. Um, and I'll apologize to, to you two and to um, any, any listeners, as you may know, I had a, I had a stroke about a year and a half ago. And uh, there are times that I still have a little bit of trouble coming up with a name or a word. So if, um, if I sometimes struggle to come up with something, that's the reason why. Okay. Um, and I just oh. forgot the point I was going to make. <laughs> I was just thinking you are 50 times more coherent than me. Uh, um, okay, let, let's backtrack. We're talking about Saw. Um, can you rewind this and play back like the, the, the last two minutes for me? We're, we're lucky that StreamYard allows me to record it to begin with. Um, um well, I'll tell you what. I, I, it'll come back to me, and, and you know, in another ten minutes, I'll I'll shout out something that no one has any idea where the hell it came from. Okay, go on. Well, this might bring us right back to it. Actually, uh, Griffin has a question related to what we're talking about, which is, uh, what are Gary's top three horror films? Ooh. Ah. Night of the Hunter. I love Night of the Hunter. Um. Pumpkinhead. Nice. Not going to apologize. Not going to apologize for that one. <laughs> and uh, what would be my third? My third is a movie that isn't really that wasn't um, marketed as horror, and a lot of people don't. Uh, it doesn't really come up in the discussion of horror movies, but it's a um, a movie with Sean Connery and Ian Bannon from 1973 called The Offense. And it's a um, it's a movie about a police detective who has seen just way too much depravity and violence in his life, played by Sean Connery in his absolutely finest hour as an actor. And during the course of interrogating a suspected child molester, all of his darker impulses, which have been um, fostered by the horror he has seen over the years comes to the surface and the movie climaxes with this 30 minute confrontation between he and the child molester, which is just, it's both riveting and absolutely horrifying. Also, I got to, there's another movie that, um, okay, we're going to move the offense down to number four. I don't know why this didn't occur to me before. My third favorite horror movie is John Frankenheimer's Seconds from 1966. Um, if you ever get a chance to see that movie, it has what remains for me the most terrifying final scene ever in a horror movie. So there you go. My top three and, well, my top four. So, so I want to talk a little bit about something that's right over your head. And that is a little haunted house statue. Oh, it's on the top shelf behind you. Not the I told you I was sick. Uh, no. I put that up there just so one of you would notice it. My eyesight uh, is terrible. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you want to you want to talk about the Stoker? Well, I want I want I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. I don't think unless you have something you really want to share. But um, I wanted to point out that is that is that the one you went one for the Great Pity? No, that's uh, that's my very first one. Uh, the one that I won for um, duty back in um, 2003, was it? Well, easy way to find out. Um, anyway, you were asking about the Great Pity? Well, yeah, actually, I, I was going to use that as a transition piece there. Oh, go ahead. He just has too many awards, Lauren. Well, you know what? That's oh, the oh thing. No, I don't. I will take as many of these babies as <laughs> they see fit to award my work. Believe me. Well, actually, let's let's put a hold on Great Pity at the moment. So you were you are one of the few that can claim both to have uh, won the Stokers and actually headed the organization uh, between two thousand five and six. Yeah. Not not an easy role. 
I, it, horror writers are infamously like cats. You know, it's it's not it's not an easy job. My heart goes out to John Palisano every day. Um, but it was an exciting time. That was at the tail end of the shock uh, the shock lines uh, message boards years where there's a lot of communication between all, everyone in the community. People were trying to find their footing. The small press was vibrant and alive, and there was places where they would be, it was being sold. And you were at the center of that moment as president. Um, can you give us a snapshot of, of what that time period felt like to you? Um, to tell you the truth, it was um, it was fairly tense um, for me um, because at the time um, the organization was in the process of getting rid of a um, uh, getting rid of a um, a certain membership level and. Uh, when you know Joe Nassis, um, when he had to step down and I stepped in, I took a look at that and I thought, you know what? I don't want to see us lose any members that we don't absolutely have to have to lose. So I extended the deadline for that for six months because that membership level was still going to bite the dust um, under my watch one way or the other. And there were uh, there were people who weren't happy with me about doing that but did it i uh but did it i did and unfortunately i think that cast a shadow over everything else that the administration tried to uh, tried to accomplish at that point um we did get a lot we did get a lot done and i was the first the one the one thing i'm proud of is that i was the first president um to have a female vice president, a female treasurer, a female secretary, um, every the, everyone else in the minute in the administration besides myself um, were female, and I think that was the first time that happened. Um, yeah, it, I was very nervous about taking the job in the first place, and all things considered, I think I did all right. Um, you know, the organization didn't. Um, the organization didn't come crumbling down into a, you know, into dust and rubble under me. And we did manage to, um, we did manage to keep, I think, something close to um, two dozen members by my extending that deadline. They were able to move up to um, affiliate status. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and now the uh, and now actually something along those same lines has been reinstated to the organization, which I was really glad to see, because the more people we can get involved in HWA, the more people there are who can spread the word. And because the, the organization, especially under Deborah LeBlanc and um, and Lisa Morton, has just made leaps and bounds. I mean, we offer scholarships now. Uh, there's Horror University. Um, there's also, you know, the, uh, the hardship fund, uh, there's just all sorts of things that are now being offered by HWA that we didn't have or weren't in the process of creating when I, um, was, pre I refer to myself more as steward than president, <laughs> but, you know, when I was at the head of the organization, you know, we didn't have a lot of these things and we do now and the organization just keeps growing and I uh, I couldn't be happier to be a part of it and I couldn't be prouder. So. So let's talk a little bit about leisure. Okay. So leisure were important to the genre at the time because it was the mass market paperbacks that were getting into hands of real readers. And what I mean by real readers is not people buying $90 special editions, but people who really wanted the quintessential beach read or the bus read that they could yeah. put in their back pocket, which I think is the most beautiful book in the world. I've said it a million times, isn't in pristine condition. The most beautiful book in the world is beat to shit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's been passed through yeah. seven owners. That's the most yeah. beautiful book in the world. Yeah, that's what I keep telling myself. Anytime I'm half price books and come across five of my own books, <laughs> you know, as long as they look like somebody has just read the living shit out of them, I'm fine. Absolutely. It's when I come across that pristine copy that looks like it has never been opened <laughs> that I, I have I have problems. Anyway, you were saying. 
<laughs> I, have to, I have to segue real quick because okay. I am also a fan of the beat to shit copies too, yeah. because if they've gone through the hands of multiple people, sometimes you get lucky and they've written little notes in the margin yes. that highlighted things. That's my favorite. Yeah. yeah. I love that. I love that. Yeah. I just had to, I, had, I just had to throw in my two cents there. I th no, I, 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 I am in total agreement with you. I think we just made a bunch of like hardcore collectors skin yeah. crawl. Boom. <laughs> Uh, but uh, you get involved with Leisure. Um, obviously, the Indifference of Heaven gets picked up as a paperback and changed into In Silent Graves. Um, you already covered. I was that was on my notes. I wanted the story about why it changed, but you got it already. Uh, but Keeper and Mr. Hands, tell us about that period with Leisure, and then inevitably the collapse and how you watched that from somewhat of afar. Well. First, it was great. Um, it was great. Don Dorio was wonderful um, to work with. And um, I was just amazed that I wound up publishing five books with them. Um, unfortunately, we couldn't come to um, an agreement for um, the sixth book in the series. And I had to uh, I had to step away, which I wasn't I wasn't crazy about, but at the same time, it was the only thing to do. And, um, you know, it was nobody's fault. Um, it's just, you, you, you come to a point where um, you and, and an editor maybe are just never going to see eye to eye on a project. And it's easier to just cut and run than it is to, you know, bang your heads against one another and wind up making enemies, which I, I didn't want to do because Don is one of the nicest human beings you'd ever want to meet. Um, but, uh, while it was going strong, it was wonderful because when Don took over, he didn't want things to be the traditional type of horror novel. He wanted to expand things a bit, um, which is good because otherwise indifference of heaven, AKA in silent graves would have never found a mass market home. Or you look at something like Tim Wagner's like death, right? Uh, which was Tim really flexing his surreal muscles, which have since just gone into <laughs> King Kong proportions in his writing. Um, it, it was wonderful. And when the inevitable, I think one of the reasons that, um, that Leisure finally folded was um, as, as the periods went on, um, readers started buying things that were just a tad more on the traditional side. Um, um, well, for instance, what, and I'm not blaming him. All right. <laughs> I can so write a name down. <laughs> so Brian Keene, if you're listening, yes. I am not blaming you, but the rising, right. Which is a, uh, which is a fantastic zombie novel and the beginning of, uh, Brian creating this vast, this vast multiverse of interconnected novels and stories. The Rising was such a juggernaut when it came out that leisure readers started looking for things that were more in that vein. Um, and again, Brian, I'm not blaming you. Well, not too much anyway. Um, <laughs> no, um, so some things it got to the point where with keepers i'll give you the, i knew things i knew that we might be getting in trouble um about the time that i had submitted keepers to don because don called me up and he said look i really really like this novel i like it a lot but it's just not horrific enough in places there was a um, there was a romance subplot in Keepers um, that at one point I I fully admit threatened to take over the story. Um, I had to cut uh, a bit of the romantic subplot and create some more horrific scenes for the the leisure novel. Um, don't get me wrong, I'm still really proud of the way that novel turned out. But um, Journal Stone, about uh, two years ago, 
oh, and I just happen to have a copy right here, um, published this. This is my preferred version. This is the original version of the novel. And people who have read them both say they read like two different books. That's because they are. Um, so uh, when it came time, um, when it came time to, uh, to do Mr. Hands, okay, this is where I got to go off on a bit of a tangent. I'm, I apologize. Um, talk about morality versus mortality, okay? As a writer, I, I can't deal a lot with outside bogeys. Um, John Carpenter once made uh, the observation that there are two types of horror there, and I, I think that he was he was doing this in broad strokes. There's um, there's liberal horror, and there's conservative horror. All right, conservative horror is the big bad, the evil, the monsters are out there, there. coming for us. Liberal horror is the monsters live inside us, and we are the monster that we fear the most. And I thought, well, there's got to be a middle ground there. And so with Mr. Hands, it was my attempt to show that one could illustrate both morality and mortality within the same tale and within the same creation. The monster, Mr. Hands, is created out of a mother's unbelievable grief and anger and it becomes her personal um, her personal golem which she sets which she then sets out into the world to avenge what she sees as being these horrific wrongs against children and if you've read the novel that backfires at one point and um, I I'm really I'm, I'm really happy with that particular novel, because I think it, it really, I think it really illustrates um, how you can have both liberal and conservative horror meet to tell a story about both mortality and um, and morality. And I'm always I'm I, I suppose that I'm 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 kind of big on stories that have a hidden moral, and uh, I always will be. Uh, I, I think that uh, I think that horror fiction, at its best, can be one of the supreme mythic literatures of our time. And uh, that's I, I keep. It sounds a little pretentious to a lot of people, but um, that's that's how I feel about it. And one more thing, and then I will okay. let you two get a word in <laughs> edgewise. Uh, I'm already tired of the sound of my own voice. Um, no, we're not. Um, to me, what horror fiction is and what it does is it explores the connections between violence, loneliness, and grief, and how we as a species try to reconcile these things with the idea of a just and loving God in a just universe where even the smallest, most mundane things that we do on a daily basis have some greater meaning. And I know that's a that's kind of a it's kind of a long-winded way to say it, but that's that's the best way I have to express it. So for me, that is what the best of horror literature is and does. So well, of course, and this would of course be the, the episode that doesn't start with my definition of the genre. <laughs> What is your definition of the genre? Oh, I don't think. I'll tell you what. I'll, I'll go grab it and I'll put it on screen in a second. Okay. Um, but I, I do think that uh, to go back a moment ago on what you said, one of the reasons that horror is the last great fanciful but human form of literature is because it can exaggerate and it can it can use dark mirroring and it can use abstraction, where other fields of literature are just kind of blinded to those concepts. So yeah. there's such a freedom there to explore the world and, and find the humanity. That's really, that's the, the third peg of the, the mortality and morality is humanity is the third peg. So I, I think it, I think that if you read something like um, it's Alan Graves or Mr. Hans or um, coffin County, you can see you searching through this tough situation to find the humanity. 
And yeah. I think that's very different than what, say, again, Brian, I love you, man. But that that's very different than the rising or that's very different than what permuted press were putting out, right? Well, um, I'll give you an argument uh, as far as the rising goes, um, because I think that there is a great deal of humanity in that book. There's also a lot of really in-your-face horror. But in the end, what Brian was doing with that novel, as far as I was, as far as I am concerned, was creating a metaphor for a um, a society that gets so self-indulgent at one point that it begins to consume itself. And then once that begins to happen, it has no idea what the fuck to do, except try and battle against itself. And, you know, that's the way I have always looked at that novel. So I didn't mean to suggest there's not humanity in the novel. Oh, I no, 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 no. The, 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 there's a difference in how much dwelling on that subject matter there is in, in mm -hmm. say, your work or Clive Barker's work. It would be another one I'd, I'd say if you look at all of Clive's perversion, it's really an attention to, it's an attempt to get at the humanity that's underneath. Oh yeah. I mean, uh, the novella Cabal, which became the movie Nightbreed, um, I think is a towering, uh, a towering piece of work. And I've probably, I've probably reread that story at least a dozen times because I just, I get caught up in what he does and I am in awe of how he does it. And, you know, that's that's always, when you get a double whammy like that, I mean, it doesn't get any better. And here's the definition. A genre of the dramatic arts that seeks to elicit a response from within an array of dark emotions. Fear, anxiety, disgust, paranoia, terror, stress, gallows humor, etc. I agree with that. Right? Yeah. For, you, for years we were hearing that, there was, that no one could define the genre. And I just, I, I, my big revelation was it's about how it makes you feel. It's yeah. not about setting. It's not about uh, any surface thing. It's just about how it makes you feel. And if it's a dark emotion, I'm willing to say it's horror. So yeah. before when you were talking, we were talking about movies, I consider a lot more horror than what most people do. Because I look at something like the movie Hardcore with George C. Scott. That's a horror God. movie. That's yeah, nothing the, but a horror movie. That The scene where, where Peter Boyle shows him that short film and he just loses it. Oh, my God. I mean, even if somebody hates the rest of the movie, that scene alone is, I mean, that is a sledgehammer to the gut. Sure it is. So I think the genre is a lot more pervasive than we give it credit for. Yeah. Um, I, I hear on, when I talk to other writers that don't work in the genre, right, I always hear, well, I don't read horror because I don't, I don't like the violence or I don't like the blood and guts, which is a, the weirdest criticism, by the way, because... There's as much, there's exactly as much blood and guts in a novel as you decide to put in your head. Yeah, and unfortunately, a lot of people who say I don't read horror because you know I've I, I've seen horror movies. Yeah, fine, <laughs> they're not one and the same. No. You know, um, and, and if you judge one by by the other, and you're not willing to go and and you know and read something like King's The Shining. And again, you want to talk about morality and mortality yes. mm -hmm. put together in something? Fucking masterpiece. It always was. And it was it was the first King novel that I ever read. And for almost two solid days, I could not put that book down. I read a little slower than most people, but I could not put that book down. And I wanted Jack Torrance to make it. I really <laughs> did. I, I, I liked him so much. I had so much sympathy for him. And it's one of the signs of a great writer where they can take a character and give you so much sympathy for him or her that you are still with them when they start to do the most horrible things. You know, you keep thinking, well, maybe they can pull back from this. Come on, come on, don't do this. Don't do And it was like that in The Shining. And, you know, I think that that was probably the novel that a lot of people realized that King was hitting on something more than ghosts and goblins and things that go bump in the night. Yeah, and I mean, like, uh, I didn't get a chance to read The Shining until last year, but and I read King from growing up. Um, sorry, I'm a little echoey right now. Okay. Anyway. No, you're um, fine, 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 fine. I can hear you, hear you, sorry. <laughs> but, I, I mean, I didn't get a chance to read The Shining until last year, and I was an alcoholic up until, like, April last year. So I got sober. And in my early days of sobriety, I read The Shining because that's a good idea. <laughs> no, no, like that, that book stuck with me so hard. And I completely agree with you about really wanting Jack to make it. And even when he's beating the crap out of Wendy and it's just that 
it, it, it's it's a tough read. It is yeah. a lot to get through. It yeah. is miles, you know, miles apart from from Kubrick. And yeah. I, you know, and I'm I hate to hate to be that person, but I, I really think that the book just there's so much in there that you don't get out of Kubrick's movie. Yeah, there was um, um Mick Garris did a two or three part adaptation as a television miniseries. Yeah. That was that actually followed the book almost to the letter, including the uh, the hedge animal attacks. And and Stephen Weber, I thought, gave a marvelous performance as uh, as Jack Torrance. Um, it's, it's been a while since I've seen it. Yeah. And um, I thought the uh, I thought the sequel, the novel, uh, Doctor Sleep, was yeah. was wonderful. Um, as was the movie. And the, the, I know we talk a lot about we should, we talk a lot about movies. I, I'm you can oh, talk about whatever you like, honestly. The thing the thing that I loved about um, about the film version of Doctor Sleep was that he was trying to make a sequel to The Shining that would satisfy both readers of the novel and the people who loved the Kubrick version. Yeah. And I think he's I think he succeeded wonderfully. I think so too. And uh, I, I bought Dr. Sleep. I bought the director's cut, which ended up being three hours long. Yes. And that was the greatest decision of my life. Yeah. Yeah. It, that's needed, three hour, it needed three hours. Yeah, it did. Time. Yeah. But Dr. Sleep, I read that as well. And, you know, I, I love both. I think I, you know, I can't, I think I probably enjoy the movie a little bit better just because it does tie up all those loose ends. Yeah. And you do go, you do leave that movie feeling very satisfied, and it's it it is an event. Yeah, yeah, I uh, I, I liked it a great deal. Um, I'm just trying to think of um, trying to oh, um, if someone um, really wants to see um, a movie that will put you through an emotional ringer and show you just how powerful. Um, horror can be without resorting to gore the babadook i was thinking that get out of my head i swear i was thinking that that movie yeah. is is that movie is uh whew. yeah i didn't think there was any way that sh the director could make anything more frightening than the short film that the babadook was based on yeah boy was i wrong no that <laughs> movie oh that that is a yeah that that movie's very much suspense but also creeping creeping horror which yeah. usually i i don't get a lot of that the creeping feeling unless i'm yeah. reading a book and you also you get to see this total breaking down of two separate personalities the mother and the child both yeah. because yeah. ultimately what the movie is about is the denial of grief yeah and Probably. you know when that grief decides it's going to take a physical form and say here you're going to deal with me whether you want to or not you know, it's, yeah. a, it's a brilliant film. Some people found it, a, you know, to be pretentious. I was not one of them. No, absolutely not. And I think there's something extremely, you know, there's something to be said about having to go into the basement and having to confront that thing that will not leave because it's just there. It's just going to live in the basement yep. and keep eating the bowl of worms you set out for it. Yeah. It, it's like, you know, you, the, the grief is never it. going to leave you alone. Yeah. You just and, have to accept it and integrate it into part of your life. Yep. And I, I loved that message. Yeah. One of my yeah, favorites. So did I. So and did there's I. that there's that abstraction as a as a part of the literary tools that is allowed in horror that other genres really just are not allowed to do. Yeah. You can externalize an idea, an emotion or or a state of mind as a character and it can exist both in a in a real physical sense and in a metaphorical or thematic sense and they're both equally legitimate yeah i don't see that in i don't see that in science fiction i don't see that in westerns a little bit there's i'm not saying these are completely not ever done i mean i think the man with no name has something to be said about um some abstraction but never to the degree so i think i think the horror genre is a very special place and i think yeah, it's I undervalued for that ability i agree Hey, uh, a while ago, you were going to ask me something about The Great Pity. I was going to ask. So Great Pity was one of those works that it's it's much more of a, again, a, a insider baseball type of uh, a moment in your career, whereas it was the, the horror community itself that responded. And 
as opposed to something like uh, the leisure years where you were hitting a wide audience. So I, I really just wanted your opinion. Like, what was that balance for you? Were you always striving to, to hit the mainstream audience or was it important for you to keep that base uh, close to your chest as well? I wrote that one for me. I, um, because um, I mentioned somewhere, um, Tim Wagoner and I both have this aversion to these um, when someone gets killed by a car, their family goes and sets a memorial up by the side of the road. Or if uh, someone is murdered in, uh, in a house in a neighborhood, people will start putting photos and candles and flowers and things like that. It's not that I, it's not that I hate such things. It's that I look at them and I think that is not for the person who died. That, that is for you. That is for you to find comfort. They are, they are beyond this now. I might even argue that it's really for the passerby to notice. Yeah. And also, no, there's that also. And that's kind of a creepy concept. Like, Hey, yeah. someone noticed that my son, daughter, mother, father is gone. Yeah. Something to be said about what that means societally, but it's also kind of self-indulgent in a very dark way. Yeah. And I got to thinking, what would happen if someone were to misinterpret something that wound up on someone's front porch? Like a candle with some flowers next to it. Well, something terrible must have happened here. I, I, I wonder what it was. And then somebody says, well... I, I should I should do something. I should add something to this. And as they do, the people who are adding these pieces to the memorial begin to wonder about who it was who died, how they died, how old they were. And then suddenly you've got people coming up with this image of a little girl who had died at the hands of an abuser. And they begin to believe this so much that they bring this little girl to life. And they only bring they bring her to life only to die all over again, and that was the idea, and it just sort of took off from there, because at one point the little girl who is the result of, you know, this uh, this gestalt uh, this gestalt imagining, herself begins to give life to other imaginary beings, who then like her come into the sentient world, and all hell breaks loose. You just blew my fucking mind. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, because I really, I love, I, I love uh, the, the like thought forms and tulpas. And, uh, you know, I see that, you know, well executed in a lot of, a lot of horror writing, but I never really see it. You know, we don't see it that much on screen. So, yeah. and then I never thought about what if the tulpa has a tulpa? Yep. What the? Yeah. Ra uh, Ramsey Campbell just uh, just loved that story. In uh, my collection, Halfway Down the Stairs, he wrote uh, this this wonderful, wonderful introduction to it. And he, um, he, he, he just loved it. And it meant the world to me that he thought that much of the story. Can so we that just was, take a, to me, that was, to me, that was, that was, that was, that was a great moment. Can we just take a moment to uh, just worship the living legend that is Ramsey Campbell? Oh God, yes. Please. Um, the work, the man, the sense of humor, the timber of his voice, I don't think it's been done better. No. No, and some people will give me an argument about this, but I think he has done more to expand and enrich the Cthulhu mythos than anyone since Lovecraft came up with it himself. Um, he had a, a, a recent trilogy of novels that just blew my mind um they're right over here the flame tree books yes yeah yeah absolutely. You know? and i you know he he can do this this cosmic horror like no one else and he can also do the everyday scare you out of your pants story as, uh better than anyone else he's just he is magnificent uh, he's also one of the most he's also one of the most warm, kind human beings you'd ever want to meet. And, you know, I've met him in, I've met him in person a couple of times, and it's been just a just an absolute thrill and honor. But yeah, Ramsey Campbell, um, folks, if you've never read him, shame on you. 
go do it now. Yeah, there, there's no excuses not to read Ramsey Campbell. No. Um, start with nameless and work onward. Yeah. Period. Done. Um, so I, I, I just we're, – we're over an hour now, so we're going to start to roll down. But uh, I, okay. I wanted to wanted to hit on our shared experience, uh, Darkness on the Edge, uh, stories inspired by the – music of Bruce Springsteen, which is an anthology we were both in yep. for PS Press. Um, that's an incredible anthology, not because I'm in it. Take me out of it. D th that table of contents should be something that everyone on Earth was drawn to. Mm -hmm. It was a who's who at the time, and then May, for whatever weird reason. But, man... Knock it, it off. You are a damn fine writer. Well, in whatever. But the imp the important thing here is that that anthology should have started a, a mini wave, I felt. I think Harrison yeah. Howe um, really came up with a concept that could have reached out to popular, to the popular masses. Yeah. Because I, 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 I and, and it's a big tragedy to me that not just that book, but there wasn't a movement to try and bring in people with more general interests into the genre. Yeah. It's a perfect I know, vehicle. I know that a few years after that, there was an anthology done of stories inspired by Janice Ian songs, but that was more, that was um, for a more literary mainstream yeah. audience. It's still a hell of an anthology, but I know I agree with you. Um, it should have started some sort of, uh, some sort of movement, however brief, briefly it may have lasted, but that was, um, yeah, that was, that was a shame that it didn't do better. Cause I'll tell you the next logical move was a, a collection inspired by this, the music of Alice Cooper or Rob Zombie. Mm -hmm. it, it kind of writes itself for the horror fan. That's in a general sense, but it crosses over. And I'd like to see, I desperately want to see the genre get out of the funk it's in, which is kind of talking to the same people and get back or to where we were in the, the late seventies yeah. and, and early eighties. You know, when I was coming up uh, as a kid and I was discovering this stuff, I could, I could talk to this about what I was into to people and they at right. least had a cultural touchstone, right? Yeah. Today, unless I say the words, the name Stephen King, I get a blank stare from anyone outside my audience, right? Right. Um, they know, but in, in my, if I'm at the supermarket, I can't say, hey, you know, I, 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 I don't need, well, I can't go like this. I can't say, I picked up the new Brian Evanson yeah. collection and it's amazing. And people look and say, hmm, well, who's that? What's that? Oh, I wouldn't like it because I don't read horror. Well, but also we, Brian Evanson has the um, has the slight um, advantage that he is getting noticed more by um, more mainstream literary readers. Um, for instance, uh, Kelly Link, when she first started, was sort of like uh, fantasy's best kept secret, and you know now she's gained a much wider readership um and rightly so of people who like to read the type of fantasy that's going to challenge them a little bit that's going to make them think uh and also at the same time offer a very enjoyable reading experience um evanson has a little bit of that going on um in his favor and hopefully that will continue to expand because he's he's brilliant and uh, but yeah, you're right. The the you know the person on the street, you show them that book, they're going to say, well, that cover's a, a little weird. And what the hell does that title mean anyway? You know, um, you know, give me give me give me something where the monsters get munchy. I like that. I like the munchy monsters. Uh, they, they desperately want another book about a writer going back to his hometown to fight that evil oh he's confronted God, when he was seven years old. They want that. Stop uh, it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's well. <laughs> and that's not even me pulling out a copy of Velocities uh, from Kathy Koja and trying to get people to understand where I'm coming from there, which was yeah. one of my favorite reads in the last five years. So I was actually kind of stunned that that didn't win the Stoker um, for, for collection. I haven't read the book that did win, um, which I, I, I plan to do, but I – that that collection was just that was just a knockout from page one to the end. It there were a couple. Is. There were a couple of stories. I I am going to fully admit this that I didn't quite get the first time I read them, 
and I went back and and reread them, and it's the, the, her stories are always the type that you can find something new every time. And um, I just I she is she's such a wondrous writer, and she's, she deserves a much larger audience than the one that she has. She is the Patty Smith of horror fiction. Yes, That's exactly. What she is. Exactly. And I mean that as the biggest compliment in the world. You know, the, the closest I think that anyone, someone once said that basically I was Raymond Carver with blood and guts. <laughs> and at the time, I, I thought of it that way, but it works. But, but at the time I hadn't, I, I, I knew who Raymond Carver was, but I hadn't read any of his work. And so I went out and got a couple of his collections and read them. And I thought, God damn it. <laughs> you know, people are going to think that I read his stuff and just, you know, I'm just aping on that and throwing in, you know, some, you know, some quantum physics and a little blood and guts, but yeah, I mean, um, pardon? Physics, that physics and blood, that's an excellent combination. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The, the physics, the quantum physics stuff just started creeping in it's and, so and cool. announcing itself, you know, you, you know, you are, you are tied to me whether you want to be or not. So I've just, I've just been going with that. That's, that's, I love that because I mean, I think, again, that's what that, that's like an untapped resource in a lot of yeah. storytelling. Quantum physics is fucking bizarre. And yeah. where is it in horror? Some, I mean, some people have used it, but not, re but not really to a, a great extent. Um, I think, you know, Dan Simmons has done it to a degree. Um, he did a novel called The Hollow Man, which could have been marketed as either science fiction or horror. And there's quite a bit of, uh, of quantum physics in that, um, okay. which is actually how I got turned on to the whole subject, um, was reading that novel. That's so. very cool. It's funny because, like, right now I have so many tabs open because I've just been, like, <laughs> keeping track of everything that you guys have been talking about today. <laughs> like, another tab for Dan Simmons in the hollow man. <laughs> well, it was really strange because at the same time he released um, a horror novel called Children of the Night which was um, a book in the, in the, um, um, in the, uh, the series that began with Summer of Night. Summer of Night, yeah. He had four novels that were in that series. And um, Children of the Night, I think, was either the second or the third one. It came out at the same time as The Hollow Man. And like The Hollow Man, it could have been marketed as either science fiction or horror. And I thought that was kind of cool because you could switch the books into the other genre and they would fit just as well yeah um you know i'm i, I suppose i'm big on 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 cross genre stuff uh, which i try not to think about why i'm writing you know whatever needs to be in the story is going to be there you know if there's some a tad science fiction fine if there's mystery romance western whatever if mm -hmm. the story needs it it's going to be there because Again, in the genre, as long as the emotional range is in place, you're, yep. you're golden. It's all allowed. There's Absolutely. no gatekeeper about content. No. Yeah. No. And I see that we've gone on way past the hour mark. Yeah, we, we absolutely have. I don't want to keep you all night, but uh, I just want to say this is an absolute pleasure to have you. You are a remarkable writer. You're a remarkable well, person. Thank and, you. And um, you have enriched the genre immeasurably. And when the big book of horror's history is written, you're going to have your chapter. It might, no oh. one likes to think of it that way, but it's, 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 it's definitely true. I think with a little bit of time and a little bit of energy, the fact that the mass market might not want have you to have gone everywhere that you wanted to go is going to actually be a benefit to you. Because yeah. there's a lot of that that snuck in anyway. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm... You know, it's, it's sometimes I bemoan the fact that I haven't been able to really catch on in uh, in the mass market. But at the same time, because I haven't, I can still do exactly what I want to do the way I want to do it. And I may not have the biggest readership out there, but goddamn, the readership I've got is loyal. And I, I just, I, I, I love each and every last one of them for that loyalty. And I hope that what I continue to produce will uh, will justify that continued readership and that continued loyalty. So. Well, I'm there for the rest of the ride. Thank you. And I'm hopping on board, but I do have my own question. You know, okay. and I do appreciate your time a ton, Gary. Uh,
But this is a really important one. I have to ask, what are your cat's favorite treats? My cat's favorite treats. Um, Feline Greenies Hairball Control. What's that? Feline Greenies Hairball Control. Feline Greenies Hairball Control. Nice. All right. Okay, I'm going to pick some of those up. They'll, uh, yeah, they'll, uh, they'll rip your fingers off to get one of those out of your hand. Mine's so. all about the temptations to have the catnip in them. Yeah, well, well, catnip, of course. And we've got two cats that are just popcorn fiends. They will absolutely get up in your lap and try to get the popcorn out of the bowl. Aww. And here. There you go. There you go. Excellent. Now we know. Now That's we know. why people and tune in. Manufacturers, manufacturers, um, you can uh, you can contact uh, you can contact the hosts of this and they'll give you my address and you can send you, you can send the money there because you know <laughs> free advertising. And of course, Stormcloud would vastly prefer the Rachel Ray's wheelies oh. so come on the desk so that when she comes begging, I can give two or three to her at any given yep. time. There you go. <laughs> I want to want to thank everyone out there that watched the show. That uh, all the people in the chat, River, Jake, Dan, Griffin, especially the people who came up with questions. Uh, uh, Steak from Off the Grill Podcast was in here. Th ben Grimm, thank you all for watching. Uh, we will be back on Tuesday with a community show where we let off steam and just talk about the genre in a much more casual fashion. Anyone who wants to be on that show, absolutely, you can come on the show. Just make sure that your webcam is on and your microphone is on before you try to join because I'm not going to let you in unless I see who you are. <laughs> and if you don't know why that is, you haven't actually met the internet. <laughs> In the meantime, have a great weekend, everyone. Yeah. Uh, you know, if you haven't subscribed already to the channel, please do. It makes a huge difference to the channel because YouTube only promotes channels that are growing. So do us that favor. Give us some love, and we will see you soon. Bye. Thank Bye. you. I'm getting pissed.